Marshal Nagronsky reporting. I'll be with you in a minute. The American Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations bring you Martin Nagronsky in the news. A complete and up-to-the-minute digest of international and national events. Before Mr. Gronsky begins his commentary, here's an important announcement. Look how Dashiell Hammett's fat man's grown. We don't mean in size, but in popularity. The fat man known as Brad Runyon knows there's no truth to the saying, murder will out. His answer to that is, oh yeah? When the professional killers or the strong arm boys go to work, all the trite sayings in the world won't bring the killer out. As Brad says, you've got to dig him out, just like the infantry dug out the pillboxes. And if you don't believe it, just ask any Joe who is there, which he'd rather have had. The assurance from some optimist that all Nazis were yellow, or a Browning automatic rifle and a flamethrower. The fat man's continually running into unlikely underworld characters. So for thrills, hear Dashiell Hammett's Fat Man tomorrow night when it's broadcast over most of these same ABC stations. And now from New York, Mr. Rogronsky. Good morning. Dark, sultry-looking clouds hang low this morning over the city skyscraper. They give promise of another miserably hot day, and they provide an appropriately threatening aerial canopy of nature under which to look at the storm signs of violence, bloodshed, and high political tension which characterize these days man's relations with man throughout the world. This afternoon, the United Nations Security Council meets once more at Lake Success to face an attempt to solve by peaceful international action two dangerous threats to world peace and security. These are the guerrilla warfare in Greece, and the Dutch attempt to crush in Indonesia, the Indonesian Native Republic's political and armed strength. On the instance of two United Nations Far Eastern states, the British Commonwealth State of Australia and the new state of India, the Council has been asked to intervene in Indonesia to end the fighting and to arbitrate a satisfactory solution. The Dutch have already objected, saying that they do not see where the UN needs to intervene. The open nature of the war between the Dutch and Indonesian forces gives this problem at least procedural preference over the more basic problem of Greece. In Greece, as a result of Russia's veto on Tuesday of the American plan to establish a permanent United Nations Border Commission to guard Greece's frontiers, the whole future of the U.N. was placed in grave jeopardy. And this afternoon, the American deputy delegate, Herschel Johnson, returns here from conferences at the State Department in Washington, where he uh, talked over what America is to do with uh, the top-level authorities on our foreign policy. With at least uh, this country's answer to this 11th use by the Russians of their great veto power expected, what Mr. Johnson has to say is of great concern. He made no attempt to hide our country's concern about the danger to the U.N.'s future, which he saw embodied in this 11th use of the Russian veto. He declared on Tuesday, before he left for Washington, that the United States could not permit the Russian action to pass by default. And today, Mr. Johnson, speaking for the United States, is expected to indicate our government's reaction to the Russian veto. Last night, I spoke with some of the members of the American delegation here in New York. But they were reluctant, until Mr. Johnson returned, to give any concrete indication of what he's going to do this afternoon. The general American feeling can be best summed up, however, by saying that this government feels that if the United Nations stands idly by now and permits the Russian veto on action in Greece to stick, then the U.N. is a dead duck. This strong and universal belief of the Americans, I can report, is shared, too, by all of the other Security Council members, with the exception, of course, of Russia and her satellite state, Poland, who backed up the Soviet veto with a negative vote against U.N. action. It's regarded as certain for that reason that the United States will propose, perhaps today or this evening, that the Greek issue be placed before the assembly in September. The Russian veto then would not apply. Or else our country may recommend that some kind of inspection system be set up outside the framework of the United Nations. The second course is the more radical. However, it also seems the more practical. That's because the assembly is not in a position under the terms of the charter to do anything concrete in the way of enforcement of peace in Greece because always over any concrete action there hangs the threat of another Russian veto. Should the United States go outside the United Nations to win peace in Greece, this would be tantamount, however, to admitting that the United Nations has failed, despite the world's great hopes, failed to prove itself an effective instrument for keeping the peace through collective and peaceful action. Though this rightly is a cause for dismay, it actually would be only one more open sign that the split between the Western world and Russia is no longer a matter of theory or of words, but is a matter of practice. After all, the Russians of their own volition have refused to take part in all of the economic and the human welfare activities of the United Nations. And besides ducking membership in all of these internal organs of the United Nations, the Russian refusal to join in the American-sponsored Paris Economic Conference has provided one more concrete sign that as far as Russia is concerned, she prefers to walk alone in the field of European and world economy. 
The Soviets veto Tuesday of the Balkan Commission that the United States has proposed is the political counterpart, any, counterpart, any way you look at it, of Russia's refusal to take part in any of these other international economic and human welfare projects that the nations of the Western world see as their only hope of winning to a durable peace. This is certainly not a happy conclusion, but it does correspond, unfortunately, with the fact. The world will certainly not be made a happier place by the refusal on the part of the world to look these facts in the face, unpleasant as they are, Look them in the face and recognize their meaning for what, the, for what it is. The United Nations has become for, uh, for Russia only a sounding board for propaganda. The Russians have deliberately turned their back on the use of the United Nations for the purpose for which it was conceived. So the demands of Australia and India for UN intervention in Indonesia will come first today on the Security Council agenda. They do not come first for all of these reasons in importance. The reaction of the United States and of the Western world so this 11th Russian use of the veto in the case of Greece overshadows the action on Indonesia. Unless the problem of what to do in Greece is solved by the United Nations, certainly any other action it takes now or plans to take in the future will be compromised before it ever has a chance to get started. And now here's your announcer. I'll be with you again in a minute with more news. Tomorrow, our Army Air Forces celebrate its 40th birthday and our American Air Force is looking forward to life beginning at 40. Born on August 1st, 1907, its first heavier-than-aircraft was a plane that flew the amazing speed of 42 miles an hour and remained aloft for one hour and 12 minutes. The young AAF grew slowly, but at the adult age of 37 in 1944, it boasted a personnel of more than 2,400,000 men. Its wartime peak for aircraft was 80,000 planes, rocket-propelled planes, Bombers that are bigger, faster, and carry a greater bomb load than ever before in history. Any young American would be proud to be a part of our Army Air Forces, which tomorrow, on its 40th birthday, is on the threshold of its greatest aeronautical advancements. We're all proud of our Air Forces. Martin Nagrowski continues with his digest of the morning news. There is tragically no longer any doubt as to the fate of the two British sergeants who were kidnapped in Palestine by the Jewish extremist underground some weeks ago. The bodies of these two men were found hanging this morning from a tree in an orange grove some five miles from the Jewish village of Netanya. The tragic discovery was made more gruesome when a booby trap attached to the bodies was exploded and blasted to bits these earthly remains. As the booby trap was tripped by British soldiers who found the bodies, one British soldier was wounded and an American photographer was knocked to the ground and his camera destroyed. Thus, the Irgun Zwei Lumi, the striking force of the Jewish extremists in Palestine, lived up to its pledge to avenge the hanging by the British two days ago of three captured members of its organization. Irgun has long used as its motto the biblical motto of revenge, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And they proved today that neither this motto nor their threat that Palestine would run with blood were idly spoken. The Holy Land, traditionally the birthplace of peace, provides in this unhappy incident yet one more proof, if the world really needs it, that violence still breeds violence, and that militant nationalism is far from dead. It's positive the British will react to this action of the Irgun with repressive police measures more stringent than any yet imposed on the Jewish community in Palestine. The British reaction may consist of a rigid curfew that will further increase the already dangerous tension. The situation in Palestine is no longer of the kind where either the ruling power Britain or the Jews whom they rule are able to approach the solution of their problems with reason. Aroused passions are becoming the major factor in the relations between the British and the Jews in Palestine. The Irgun action in hanging the two British sergeants is in line with their philosophy of violence. But their action in booby-trapping the bodies of the two men is certainly outside the bounds of even the most determined kind of reprisal. This seems an unforgivable act of savagery by the extremists, which the Jewish community in Palestine will abhor just as much as the outside world. The great tragedy of Palestine is that for the Jewish extremists, the terrible violence they practice stems from their desire to save the lives of their displaced compatriots elsewhere. The whole business is reminiscent more and more of the Irish Rebellion, where a desire for independence resulted in a savage revolution. If ever there were an instance of the importance of outside intervention through the United Nations, certainly this is one. The UN Investigation Commission on Palestine should hurry its solution, if any, or the Holy Land will literally run with blood, not milk and honey. The much-heralded investigation of Howard Hughes' uh, wartime contracts, airplane contracts, still has produced more smoke than fire. Senator Pepper of Florida is reported today as having said in Washington that an aircraft expert's appraisal of Hughes' photo reconnaissance plane as a hot wagon 
showed that Elliot Roosevelt, the late president's son, had grounds for pushing the wartime construction of the ship. Pepper told this to a reporter and says he thinks that should be the chief question before the Senate War Investigating Committee. Howard Hughes, however, had other ideas about it. He advanced to uh, Senator Brewster, who, who apparently has been the leading light behind this investigation, a series of questions in which he indicated that, um, he, that uh, Senator Brewster had been supporting what is known as the chosen instrument policy for uh, American overseas airlines. That is a policy of using the Pan American Company run by Juan Tripp and a company which is a, a very strong competitor of Howard Hughes Transworld Airlines. That Senator Brewster had been supporting the, the, um, the Pan American uh, cause. Hughes, in fact, uh, called the investigation a blackmail weapon and made other very strong uh, charges against Brewster. Brewster kept his uh, silence and replied only by saying uh, that he referred anyone interested to Chapter 6 in the book of Nehemiah in the Bible. He said he had nothing further to say. Well, when a Bible was looked up, uh, Brewster, uh, Brewster posed with it, and uh, Nehemiah, uh, number 6, was open for study. And the chapter is headed by, a, by words which read as follows. San Ballot practiceth by craft, by rumors, by hired prophecies to terrify Nehemiah. And apparently that's Brewster's answer, at least so far, to Mr. Hughes. Well, Mr. Hughes' publicity agent, Mr. Meyer, is reported this morning en route here from Paris. is expected to testify tomorrow. It's politics as usual outside the Congress now. The most important political action of the past 24 hours was the announcement at Columbus, Ohio, by Senator John Bricker, who was the 1944 vice presidential nominee, that he's willing to step aside as Ohio's favorite son for Senator Robert Taft. Senator Taft revealed that at Columbus, Ohio, said he had the right of way from his junior colleague, Senator Bricker. Governor Dewey is objecting to the criticism of him, the criticism that he is refusing to say anything about major issues. Dewey remarked sarcastically at Flint, Michigan, what am I supposed to say? Don't shoot till you see the whites of their eyes. And Dewey remarked, too, I did a lot of talking in 1944, and I was the only one who did. And the Mr. Dewey, the governor of New York, might also have remarked that his talking did not win him the election. Now, here's a special message for you. Boxing fans, Monday night for the first time in years, there will be just one undisputed world's lightweight boxing champion. That's when New York State's champ, Bob Montgomery meets the National Boxing Association's number one lightweight, Ike Williams. One of the two will step into a championship held in the past by such ring greats as Joe Gans, Battling Nelson, Denny Leonard, Tony Canzanieri, Barney Ross, and Henry Armstrong. Which of the two it'll be, only the future will tell. They're about evenly matched, although when they met in a bitterly contested bout in 1944, Montgomery won by a knockout. Needless to say, Ike Williams intends to reverse the proceedings. It promises to be a win of a battle, so don't miss the blow-by-blow -blow account of the Bob Montgomery-Ike Williams fight for the Undisputed World's Lightweight Championship broadcast over most ABC stations this Monday night. Martin McGronsky will be heard tomorrow morning at this same time in another of his news broadcasts. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.